everyone. So I'm Marie Louise T. Sanson, and I'm ever so pleased to welcome Laura Jane, Laura Jane Smith, who so very kindly agreed to give our fourth annual lecture. And we see the annual lectures as something, an event that highlights core aspect of heritage and heritage research. And of course, it could not be a better person than Laura Jane to do that. We also, since we are in this very unusual situation of doing everything online, we also should celebrate that that actually provides us with the opportunity of sharing this very widely to students, former students, not just our students, but other people's students, to researcher inheritors, to professionals inheritors, and very, very widely. So that is really, you know, if there's one good thing from the pandemic, then the fact that we do, can actually perform as universal citizens, global citizens who can share across the world and can share this very particular interest. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all. I'll come back to Lord Jane in a second. But on behalf of the Heritage Center, I'm really very pleased to welcome you. And that despite the strangeness of this kind of format that we are able to be together for an evening and thinking and sharing some of our concerns and some of the guidance that Laura Jane will provide with us. So thank you very much for tuning in and thank you very much for participating. So I'm so pleased to be able to welcome Laura Jane. And I know she doesn't need any introduction, but I would like to give her introduction nonetheless. And I think if you look up Laura Jane's webpage, it says that she is head of the Center for Heritage and Museum Studies at the Australian National University, Canberra. And that actually hardly touches anything because as you read that line, you realize that such centers would not have existed had it not been for Laura Jane, that she has been so instrumental and so core in developing what we now almost take for granted as heritage studies. When Lord Jane started in this area, it didn't exist. And not only has she been so fundamental to that, <clears throat> but she has also been very strong in guiding us towards some of the core concepts, some of the core understandings that we had to get in place in order to seriously uh, study, analyze, and participate in debates about heritage. And I'm sure every heritage student who know about the authorized heritage discourse, it's probably something they learn about in their first term. And it's something very important to learn about. But behind that, there's deeper philosophical thinking about the nature of heritage that Laura Jane has helped us to connect with and reveal. And I think in particular, her helping and shifting attention away from heritage we see it as a static to a very profound connection with an understanding of heritage, which is about process. And it's not just an automatic process, it's an ever ongoing, ever changeable nature of a process through which people construct meaning and construct memory. And that gets me to the second thing she's done because although people are everywhere in Laura Jane's work, people are there at different levels from the individuals to particular groups of peoples to people as institutions and bodies of institution. And that's also a very important insight she has helped us to understand the different ways and some of the tools which are used at those different levels. And I should remind you that she has worked with uh, through ideas of class, she has worked with indigenous, she's worked with multiculturalism, she's also done things from gender, that's a while ago, we have to return to that. So she's worked with people constituted at different levels and also in different ways. So in that way that when we read and when we are guided by Lord James thinking, she never allows the heritage discussion to stay still and consolidate as if now we know what it is. It's always this part of, it is a process and we are a project trying to engage with that. And that I think has been enormously 
inspirational, but also very, very important in terms of helping creating a solid understanding of some of the concept and some of the concern we have to embrace. I wanted to just very finally also say that if you look at your reading list, you know that Laura Jane have written a lot. If you look at her publication list, you will discover she's written even more. She has been a very prolific writer. But in addition to being a prolific writer, because one can produce long publication lists in different ways. Every piece, it's as if they have every piece is very carefully crafted. So every piece of Laura Jane's work actually has been part of a step towards that maturation of the field of heritage studies. And she has very, very generously shared with us all this sort of deep philosophical and political engagement with what heritage is. So I am very pleased and very grateful that Laura Jane was willing and able, I say able because I think it's six o'clock in the morning where you are, yeah, that to step in, say yes, despite all the problems of this year, we can have a, the fourth annual Heritage Seminar and on behalf of the whole group, very, very pleased to welcome you. Laura Danes is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Marie Louise. Thank you for such a very kind and and um, and and fulsome um, in, introduction. Um, I'm blushing, and um, <laughs> uh, I will. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. I, I do I do really appreciate it, and I'm, I am I'm very pleased to be here. So I am going to start. And as uh, Murray Louise mentioned, I am um, in Canberra at the moment. Whoops, we hit a problem. Right, there we go. I'm in Canberra at the moment, speaking from um, Numbri and Ngunnawal land, and I pay my respect to um, the Numbri and Ngunnawal people whose sovereignty was never ceded. A strong sense of nostalgia underpins calls to make America great again, to return to a mythic time of empire as Britain rejects European identity. In Australia, the political party One Nation looks back to an Australian past where what was called the Australia, what was called the, the White Australia policy uh, framed immigration practices. The emotive registers of populism are stark. Nostalgia in its reactionary form has been used to both soothe and justify fear of change and ambiguity, and thus help give emotional legitimacy to radical right-wing agendas. Can heritage studies have anything to say about the increasing prevalence of right-wing populist nationalist debate? I want to say yes. However, there is a theoretical argument to be, deve to de to be developed about how such inter interventions and contributions are, are framed. In developing my response, I developed two linked arguments. First, heritage is a political resource and understanding historic buildings, archeological sites and other objects of historical value as heritage, or at least in the ways I want to theorize this concept, directly implicates heritage in political struggles. Thus, the first half of the lecture will develop my arguments about the nature of heritage and in particular look at its effective and political qualities. The second argument, drawing on the theoretical framework I develop, is that sites of heritage making can be understood as one of the many arenas of either justification for political conservatism or arenas of resistance and affirmation of progressive, uh, of progressive politics. Certainly there have been long-term debates in both heritage and museum studies about how the interpretation of sites, places and artifact collections should be developed to intervene in and influence social and political debate. These have occurred alongside calls for greater diversity and inclusiveness in, in what is conserved and listed on registers. Those debates are important. Yes, we need to be collectively more aware about how sites and museums are interpreted and how, and, and, and more, and how they can be more inclusive and critical um, and how we can be more inclusive and critical in our practices. However, what I want to do is to look at how visitors themselves use such places, 
because visitors are partners with heritage and museum professionals in the construction and propagation of the meaning and values represented by historic places. In effect, if a place is not visit, visited or otherwise used, it has no social or historical value. To be heritage, a site or place needs to be used as such. There are of course no inherent values. Moreover, visitors are not neutral audiences necessarily concerned about learning the expert's message, but rather perform through their visits their own meanings about the significance of the past for the present. Thus, in the second half of the lecture, I draw on work I have, been, uh, I have done with visitors in the United States to uh, Montpelier and the Hermitage, two uh, plantations owned by um, US presidents, and to the National Civil Rights Museum. Now, I alert you now that some of the visitor quotes I use in the lecture are overtly racist, and I use these to illustrate the points I am making about the political nature of heritage. The link to heritage and right-wing populism is not new. Hewitson, Lowenthal, Wright, and others in the 80s, as the field of heritage studies began to emerge, challenged the conservative uses of heritage in Margaret Thatcher's and Ronald Reagan's conservative agendas. In the debates that followed, the emotional aspects of heritage tended to be neglected and were often dismissed as pro promoting mawkish nostalgia and uncritical nationalism. Additionally, while heritage was acknowledged as political, little in-depth or critical examination of the nature and consequences of heritage as a political moment were undertaken. That is, in these early debates, Heritage was identified as being used for political purpose, but not theorized or understood within the context of power relations and struggles. In effect, the uses of heritage within latter 20th century right-wing populist debate and the early canonical responses, responses to this initiated a tendency in early heritage studies to be hesitant about looking too closely at conservative uses of the past. Rather, there has been a pronounced tendency to focus on the progressive work of practitioners, firstly to counter the early critiques, and secondly, in the hopes that reinforcing the progressive agendas of practitioners and academics would mean the public uses of heritage would be equally progressive. That this is a problematic assumption is highlighted by the work I'm, I've done with visitors. Now, the development of what is now called critical heritage studies as a response to this lack of political engagement is important. This is because this movement aims explicitly to intervene in the political uses of heritage, but such engagement requires a pragmatic engagement with both the emotion and the power of heritage, which is where I shall turn now. And I'm just, we've probably seen enough of their faces. Now I'm building on uh, my earlier arguments that heritage is not so much a, a thing, but rather as David Harvey, Harvey uh, also argues a verb. Drawing on the work of Judith Butler and Diane Taylor, I have argued heritage is, set, is a set of practices that perform heritage making. Heritage narratives that speak to national, local, familial, individual identity, sense of place and so on are continually performed, negotiated and remade through a range of practices undertaken by experts, nations, subnational groups, families, individuals, and so on. These performances are, are framed by discourses that both influence and are influenced by material social structures and concerns such as gender, class, race, ethnicity, and so on. I wanna be clear, my theorizing is not based on constructivist, relativist, or flat ontologies, but sits firmly within critical realism, particularly that expressed by Archer, Sayer and the earlier works of Roy Baskar. The performances of heritage making are also influenced by and influence emotions and ideology. The emotional or effect, effective is in itself also interlinked with ideology as it is with struggles over power. Muff and Lecoeur argue that democratic politics is agonistic, that it is typified by antagonisms, tensions over established hegemony and the mobilization of intense emotions. The passions of these emotions are illustrated in the conflicts over statues uh, representing, for instance, the, the Southern Confe Confederacy, Leopold Rhodes, and in this instance, Captain Cook. However, any understanding of agonistic tensions needs to be grounded in pragmatic understanding of both effect and politics. Okay, so within the effective turn in the social sciences, 
there have been two broad positions on effect. One argues that effect and emotion are separate and effect, uh, and effect uh, is the initial body, bodily response. And it is both pre-social, effect is, it's argued is both pre-social and pre-cognitive drawing. And this work draws in particular on the work of Thrift, Masumi and Deleuze. Effect in this theorization is seen as often unconscious and unanticipated. This position has developed in part as a response to postmodernist positions on discourse in which everything was reduced to text. However, these positions go too far in their concern of, with the body and their core concern with the conceptualization of effect as pre-social has resulted in an analytical focus on emergent atmospheres. Contextualization of these being analytically irrelevant. Assumptions about the meaning of pre-social effect are allowed to exist unchallenged, assumptions that tend to reflect the researcher, researcher's own social experiences and thus are unsurprisingly andro and, and Eurocentric. Human agency and social context is entirely downplayed. So instead, I draw on the work of Margaret Wetherill and make no real distinction between effect and emotion. Effect and emotion are always discursively mediated and understood and expressed within social contexts. Moreover, effect or emotion is integral to cognition, the making and justification of social ju judgments and to the processes of remembering. Emotions play an important role in verifying recollections and the meaning of the past. If the processes of remembering feel right or are emotionally accurate to use Adam Morton's terms, then those memories and the wider meanings and narratives they support are affirmed. Emotions are also subject to feeling rules. That is, they are regulated by social societal norms and practices. A picture on the on the slide in front of you is of the Australian War Memorial and there are of course certain feeling rules that govern how people should interact with with that with this that site. Certain emotions are encouraged and expected, others um, others are of course rejected. <clears throat> Now I draw on Wetherill's idea of effective practice where effect and emotion are always intertwined, both embodied and semiotic. Practice, as Wetherill argues as both noun and verb, is a way of conceptualizing social action as constantly in motion, while yet recognizing too that the past and what has been done before constrains the present and the future. While practice can be about improvisation, it is also about repetition and training. So the point to stress here is that to be affected by a heritage object or place requires two things. Firstly, it requires knowledge and valuation of that object or place. Secondly, it requires you to care in particular ways. For example, standing on the banks of this Australian watercourse may seem, depending on your sense of aesthetics, pretty, a nice place to have a picnic or uneventful. To be affected by the massacre that occurred here requires you to know a to know about it and care and be concerned that it occurred. Caring is influenced not simply by cultural or social context, but also by ideology. What a person chooses to care about and how they are affected will be influenced by political beliefs and values. Rather than dismissing the idea that the politics sorry, that the political attitudes of indi individuals lack the coherence of organized ideology, John Yost argues that ideological positions help to frame the way an individual processes, processes information. Political attitudes are linked to social and cognitive motives. For political conservatives, for example, the motive to manage fear and uncertainty is marked. Conservatives are uncomfortable with social change and that fear and unease with ambiguity is linked to politically conservative tendencies to resist social change and to justify and accept inequality and thus maintain the status quo. In sum, I'm arguing <clears throat> that effect and emotion are themselves a form of practice that is discursively framed and mediated. Not only does social context matter, Emotions are also influence, sorry, emotions also influence and are indeed influenced by ideology. 
The word heritage itself is what William Reddy calls an emotive. It invokes sense of place, identity and well-being. The heritage practices and performances we engaged in are negotiated and constructed and reconstructed and legitimized by the feeling rules or emotional repertories of the effective practices we engage in. Heritage meanings and narratives are charged with emotion that works to ne negotiate these or affirm and reinforce them. So if heritage is emotional, then how might we understand its political um, nature? Now I turn to the politics of recognition here. And what the reinvention of right-wing populism and counter movements such as Black Lives Matter, among other movements such as the environmental women's and land rights movements and so on illustrates is that how, we, how one is represented and consequently recognized or not is integral to struggles over the distribution of power. There are varying arguments about how um, recognition should be understood but basically the politics of recognition can be characterized as a struggle in which a particular group demands acknowledgement and recognition from other groups in society of itself or aspects of its, hist its identity and its historical and contemporary circumstance. And of course, other groups may resist these demand and thus work to exclude through the continuation of, or absence of, of sorry, through the continuation of an absence of recognition or through the development of or maintenance of new forms of misrecognition. Now, how and why this is played out and most importantly, how the consequences of this stood, is understood varies considerably in, the, in much of the debate. Claims for recognition of difference and identity, however, I, I, um, I'm asserting are linked as uh, Nancy Fraser maintains to demands and calls for restorative justice, social inclusion, and greater equity in political negotiations over the distribution of resources such as finance, welfare, housing, education, and so on. So for Fraser, redistribution and recognition are intertwined. And this is an, an important point. Recon recognition cannot simply meet a human need or address an abstract sense of well-being, as theorists such as Charles Taylor and Axel Honneth, em Honneth rather, emphasize. Rather, it also has material motivation and consequences centered on restorative justice. Central to Fraser's concern of parity of participation is, um, uh, sorry, central uh, is the idea of uh, parity of partition, participation. A lack of recognition or misrecognition desire, uh, denies parity of individuals and or groups in participation in societal and policy no negotiation over the distribution of resources. The result of recognition should be equity in societal participation and in the distribution of resources and rights and legitimacy given to different forms of knowledge and values. But of course, those in privileged positions do not share rights easily. Consequently, recognition is always an ongoing struggle. As James Tully argues, any resolution will always contain non-consensus, non injustice and compromise. Inherent is, in this process is the risk that further misrecognition may also be a result of recognition claims that only further undermines parity and equity. Some criticism of the politics of recognition argues that there has been too much focus on the issue of subaltern identity and not enough on dominant identities, a point of particular relevance to the um, plantation examples I'm going to turn to in a moment. It seems logical that a degree of what I'm calling self-recognition must underwrite a politics of recognition in that individuals and groups must be able to historically situate their social and cultural identity and experiences. So those seeking justice must first recognize themselves as the inheritors of particular marginalized identities and seek solidarity with those similarly positioned. In addition, those from whom recognition is sought must self-recognize and historically situate themselves as the inheritors of privilege and rights denied to others. The ability of dominant groups to engage in critical reflections to a level sufficient to acknowledge the need to recognize others in such a way that facilitate re facilitates redistribution requires considerable self-evaluation. So at this point, it's, it's useful to circle back to, to emotions. 
As Axel Honneth argues, emotions may not only engineer claims for recognition, but also influence how the politics of recognition and distribution are played out. For example, shame of racism may compel some to offer recognition while it may cause others to withhold it. Certainly both the emotion and the skill of empathy is central to the self-reflection and self-recognition needed by dominant or privileged groups to recognize themselves as needing to offer uh, recognition and respect. Empathy, however, has been extensively criticized as a superficial emotion that privileges that privileged groups feel for another and having felt it can move on and gain, in doing so, gain a real insight to the inequitable experiences of others. This can be true. Nonetheless, sincere or deep empathy linked to compassion and imagination is important for imagining how social justice uh, is to be addressed. How exactly does the idea of heritage fit into the politics of recognition? Simply heritage is a resource of power within such struggles. Now, to be clear, I am not saying it is the only or primar primary resource here, just that it is one of the resources. Heritage sites and places do not, um, heritage sites and places not only link to, I should say, and are charged with representing a people's identity and sense of place, but as a performative effective practice, heritage negotiates the meaning and legitimacy of selected aspects of the past to bolster claims in the present. Heritage is also the process through which individuals and, group work, individuals and groups work through their own sense of self-recognition as either in need of redistribution or the holders of privilege. Popular struggles, to give one example of the fate of Confederate sol soldiers' statues, are thus directly implicated in the politics of, re of recognition and redistribution. Heritage is neither in inherently conservative or progressive, but it is itself a site of public and emotive negotiations over social justice or the status quo. There are sites of struggles over recognition and redistribution and the legitimacy or otherwise of social values and ideology. So how does this play out? <clears throat> so to explore this, I turn to um, an analysis of visitors to three sites of heritage or three sites of heritage making. Interviews with visitors were collected at these sites in the summers of 2011 and 12. Now, the, while these were collected in the United States when Obama was president and not in the context of current and ongoing conservative developments, they point nonetheless to currents and themes that exist within society that populists have hooked into. For example, the covert and overt racism of some visitor responses I'm going to show you have simply become once again more overt under Trumpism. These interviews were part of a larger study in which I have analyzed four and a half thousand interviews from 45 heritage sites and museums from the United States, Australia and England. Sites were chosen, and this is the, the uh, standard set of questions that were asked across um, the sites. Sites were chosen either because they displayed national historical narratives or displayed dissonant and contested histories. And I don't have time to go into the methods I use, but I'm happy to answer questions on these. All interviews were recorded and these standard questions were asked. Now the study, looked at the memory and identity work people undertook as they visited sites and museums and argued that visitors undertake four quite distinct heritage performances. Combinations of which, of any of these performances listed here, uh, could occur in any one visit. So these performances centered on in intergenerational communication, uh, performances of recognition and of active misrecognition and most commonly performances of reinforcement. In this performance of reinforcement, visitors existing knowledge, narratives about the past and present, social values, beliefs, and so on, were actively reinforced through a process of emotional investment in a visitor's entrance narrative. 
Performances of reinforcement were most common, were the most common uh, um, performance and occurred at all sites and tended to underpin other performances. So I'm going to look at detail in detail now at the performance of reinforce perform the performances of reinforcement and the implications uh, this has for our understanding of the emotional politics of heritage and how everyday practices of heritage uh, can impede or not recognition and redistribution. That is how they are indeed political. So we have Andrew Jackson's The Hermitage, the upper, uh, upper picture here uh, in Tennessee, and James Madison's Montpelier. Both Jackson and, and, and Madison, of course, were film, former presidents. At the time of, of the interviews, um, both sites had interventions into the history of enslavement that had occurred at, at both sites. So at Jackson's, um, there was an exhibition, and at Montpelier, so at the Hermitage, there was an exhibition and at, at Montpelier, uh, reconstructions of the slave quarters uh, located close to the house were, um, had, been, had been built and archeological excavations um, of the foundations of other uh, quarters were on display. So visitors to those house museums, like most national American museums, tended to be dominated by white, well-educated middle-class Americans. Most visitors interview were undertaking through a relative pass relatively passive uh, register of engagement, a performance of reinforcing a homage, ho ho I knew I was gonna ha have problem with this word, um, a standard collective understanding of, or consensus understanding of, of class, ethnic and national identity. So for example, so what was being reinforced at these sites was a sense of the first visitors um, belief in, in, the, in the forefathers, that is the, the founding um, presidents. Our country enjoys the freedoms that it has today because of men like etc. And I should note here that in the um, extracts from the interviews that I'm using, that both the job descriptions and the ethnic descriptors are the interviewee's own words. They're not categories that I've applied. The messages taken away or the meanings that these sites had as aids to national memory are summarized by one visitor at James Madison's Montpelier who stated that the message taken away was freedom, freedom, unity, while going on to observe that the meaning of the site lay in its ability to provide a grounding, centering sense of national identity. While the register of engagement for these two sites was overall quite passive, many visitors demonstrated fleeting moments of deep emotion. These sites did engender tears, with many visitors becoming momentarily teary-eyed when they talked about what they saw as the positive achievements of both presidents. While these moments could be intense, they were often momentarily, uh, they were often momentary and reflected well-rehearsed and comfortable feelings of patriotism, so that despite their intensity, they could be understood as banal. Intertwined with the nationalizing narratives of freedom taken from both sides was a further interlinked narrative that linked explicitly to the idea of the American dream. At these sites, a theme in visitor discussions about the meaning of the site was the celebration of the achievement of the presidents and in particular, Jackson's humble origins. So yeah, the first person says, yeah, I think we have a lot to learn about the work, work ethic from these, these people. There wasn't anybody, she's, she, she is talking about Jackson here, there wasn't anybody enabling them to live, they had to do it themselves. So the celebration of hard work of the elites at these houses reinforced visitors' belief in the dream and its underpinning pos position in American uh, identity and patriotism. Simultaneously, however, and counterintuitive to the ethos of the dream, this celebration also constructed a sense of humility and deference for the social elites represented by the houses. A deference that takes on an ex 
explicit power to facilitate the exclusion of the hard work of the enslaved. The first speaker, for instance, in discussing the ethic of hard work is referring to those in the big house, her conclusion that there was no one there to enable the work of, of Jackson, that he had to do it himself, illustrates the power of the dream to frame the way the past is remembered and forgotten and to both exclude and include. On the other hand, the second speaker notes the controversies uh, of Jackson's involvement in slavery and his disposition of, of a dispossession rather of, of Indigenous Americans. But once acknowledged, this is forgotten as he transitions back to feeling comfortable about what he calls the amazing story of the American dream that he defines Jackson as representing. So the comforting idea of the American dream and the motive of hard work by the elites allowed some visitors to glide over challenges to their entrance narratives and their celebratory embodiment of, embodiment of being in place. Remember there were um, interventions at these sites on, on the history of enslavement. However, other visitors in, in addressing the hypocrisy underlying the national narrative of freedom and the history of, of slavery and its legacies were a little, bo little bit more active in maintaining their sense of comfort and patriotism. In maintaining their consensual understanding of a shared Southern or national heritage, some vi visitors emotionally disconnected themselves from the enslaved, a response that also tended to reinforce their uh, ethnic paternalism and race racist stereotypes. So in this response, uh, which was given at the end of the interview I had with this woman, I had asked if she had noticed the interpretive material on enslaved African uh, Americans. And having answered in the affirmative, um, I then asked what she had thought of it. The response here uh, is, is, is telling. This resident of Mississippi had earlier told me that she had that the history she was visiting uh, at this site was that of her grandparents and that the visit, and I quote, makes me feel very proud of our country and our leaders, end quote. However, she stated that she did not know that she really looked at the exhibition on slavery, having read it for information only, referring to it in a supposedly non-emotional cerebral register. It had not in a thus altered her effective practice of visiting. The racism here invokes the idea that enslaved Africans, of course, somehow supposedly benefited from their ca captivity. Others also referenced ethnic paternalism to cosily un and unthreateningly assimilate the histories of class inequality into national narratives. The paternalism of these sites was expressed through the motive of the so-called kind slave owner and a cosy idea of community. So for example, <clears throat> the cosy community motive um, works here to render the complexities of the past unthreatening to a visitor's sense of well-being and de derive from consensus and unambiguous national narrative narratives and identities. Tensions over diversity and the histories of inequality and, in, and injustice and the legacies these have in and for the present are neutralized in the motive of the good, the so-called good master of, slave, of, a, of slaves, who is himself identified as hardworking. And in the motive of a benevolent community that this then underpins. Indeed, one visitor went so far as to project her sense of cosy safety onto the enslaved, noting how she, like Jackson's sense of family and how hospitable they were to other people. Observing about the enslaved, I felt like they, you know, they felt like they, this was a safe place to be. The historical ambiguity of the so-called paradox of slavery and founding concepts of American freedom and the insecurities of a national sentiment that this represented was for many visitors not challenged or rendered understandable to those visitors seeking reinforcement of national narratives. Jackson was known for a violent temper and examples of that temper in his treatment of the enslaved were identified in the exhibition as one visitor noted but went on to dismiss as, and I quote, it was a bad time in our history. 
This visitor, although hesitantly acknowledging that slavery and Jackson's treatment of the enslaved was, and I quote, not particularly good, dismisses the information uh, that he, you know, that he's apparently learnt in the exhibition about Jackson's treatment of the enslaved and its destabilization of his performance of reinforcement, reinforcement by ultimately blaming the victim here. In another example, a visitor, while conceding the continuation of injustice in the United States through the information he he has gained from the exhibition at the Hermitage works to, dim, to dismiss both the significance of this information and its ability to challenge his entrance narratives. He notes, in some ways, Jackson appeared on the surface to be a fairly decent slave owner. This visitor then goes into a lengthy discussion um, of the exhibition text, moving back and forwards between noting that enslavement was not good but there were benefits, laughingly observing, and I quote, I've worked for companies who thought they owned me, end quote, engaging here in shallow insincere empathy, shallow empathy working to dismiss the significance of the historical experiences of the enslaved and to, develop, and to validate their status as property. He eventually acknowledges that the history of inequality is a quote, part of American culture, end quote, but goes on to immediately claim that the issue is one is a global one. Any concerns about the legacies for uh, American culture is deflected into a concern that contemporary forms of slavery are occurring in other regions of the world. And thus what should be addressed is, is this global issue rather than um, considering American culpability. The reading of the exhibition text by visitors in re is, is reinforcement. Sorry, the reading of the text of, of uh, visitors engaged in reinforcement is not, and I want to stress this, about the persuasive power of historical evidence. It is about sustaining their emotional commitment to their sense of well being about their place in contemporary society. The museum. The House Museum performance of reinforcement legitimizes and maintains privileged indifference to past injustices and their contemporary legacies. Certainly what is reinforced are racist stereotypes and paternalism, which appear to be more than indifferent given the power they have to maintain contemporary inequalities. However, indifference is what is affirmed by the comfortable humility and national identity that is sustained by the performance of being at these museums. Being indifferent has considerable power. It facilitates the ability to ignore or dismiss that which threatens the social and political comfort of the performance of reinforcement. Now, of course, not all visitors engaged in reinforcement of narratives that facilitated indifference and maintain the social values of the status quo. Others indeed could be quite critical, for example, However, what visitors to these museums reveal is that heritage as an emotive is implicated in both populist and mainstream conservative movements. The cosy comfort of visiting a um, house museum or indeed any museum of, of national heritage making does not simply reinforce received national narratives and values. The visit is itself an effective practice that creates and recreates emotional states that facilitate the maintenance of indifference to others while asserting the emotional well being and legitimacy of a visitor's own sense of social place and identity. Here, fear of social change is soothed, social and ethnic privilege is rendered emotionally unproblematic, if not legitimate. Misrecognition is maintained. Now, I don't know the ideological or political leanings of the uh, individuals I interviewed. However, collectively, the performativity of their visit of such, of such places itself does political conservative work. However, not all performances of reinforcement had politically conservative consequences. The performance of re reinforcement, in fact, had two variants. 
the conservative variant dominated at, at house museums as it did at other sites of national story making. But a progressive variant also occurred, which I refer to as a performance of affirmation. Now, affirmation tended to occur more frequently at sites of, of dissonant history and statistically was dominated by visitors from politically from political and socially non-dominant ethnic backgrounds or those from dominant ethnicities with low educational attainment in all three countries. Now I'm only going to draw on examples from the National Civil Rights Museum in Tennessee. Now in the performance of affirmation, what is affirmed is the political values held by the visitor. This can be closely linked to uh, performances of recognition that centered on the sense to which a visitor's identity and social and social experiences mattered, asserting that sense of self-esteem that was that's important to underpin um, uh, claims for recognition. Indeed, these affirming pro pro performances of reinforcement are often a prequel to performing certain types of, of recognition. Now, examples of affirmation from the, the National Civil Rights Museum include So for the last, the, the second speaker on your slide, as, as for other visitors at this um, exhibition, this affirmation was sometimes saddening, if not distressing, as they reflected on experiences they or, or their parents had lived through, or as they acknowledged continuing discrimination and injustice. However, it was also, as the first speaker asserts, validating. As the second speaker, went on to, sorry, as the, the first speaker, I should say, went on to state, um, being at the museum was, and I quote for me, it's empowering. And empowering to affirm his memories and experiences in the civil rights movement and to remember what Dr. King had accomplished. As many older African-Americans American visitors noted the museum did not change their views, but rather provided an opportunity to remember and validate their memories of their experiences. Such affirmations were quite self consciously personal and left space for critical reflections on the meaning of the past for the present. So, this woman, for uh, example, noted that in visiting the museum that her views had not changed because she, and I quote, pretty much lived through this, end quote. But she went on to reflect as she does here on the poverty she had seen while driving through Memphis on her way to the museum and reflecting that poverty had been a concern of Dr. King's. Yet another visitor who stated that their visit had, visit had been an affirmation noted, I think some pro, what prophetically given that this was 2012, that it's been a long struggle with a lot of, a lot of work still to be done. Discrimination has taken new terms and it's like evil is looking for a new place to turn. While another visitor whose personal memories were affirmed observed the fight still goes on. There's still voting disparity, disenfranchisement, there's still job discriminations and so on. Younger visitors to the museum could not draw directly on personal memories of the civil rights era. Nonetheless, they drew on a range of other personal links. For example, confirmation of their own experiences of discrimination um, or, or those of, of their communities or of familial memories, or because I'm the future of that history that we made. These personal connections led to deeper and personal reflections on the past and present. To be proud of, 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 of who you are, to remember the past so that you can get on with the future not to give up on the struggles for e equity and so on. 
Another couple who found the museum highly affecting ex explicitly because they were visiting to remind themselves about racism in, racism in America, noted their views on this topic had been affirmed, stating it's affirming, it's reaffirming, but you know, it's certainly invigorating too. This affirmation was part of the reason he and his partner, both who self-identified as white American, had come to the museum as it represented an opportunity to think about important stuff, to think about, in effect, as they're doing here, the race, racial issues in America. While this couple were not the man and, and, and his partner who were visiting the museum were not as, as many of the African uh, American visitors to the site were doing, drawing on personal or shared experiences of discrimination. Um, their visit was nonetheless less a self-conscious -con reinforcement of their personal politics. The woman of the couple was in tears throughout most of um, the interviews, uh, but offered a, but offered uh, uh, in response to the question about emotions, the simple response of frustrated, indicating this was neither a celebratory or banal or comforting experience. Now, this is not to say that it was a bad experience, it was affirming but the affirmative version of the performance of reinforcement was less about comfort than it was about resolve. As another self-identified Caucasian American visitor stated, the museum visit reminds me of the importance of standing up for what's right, even, even if it's not necessarily safe or comfortable. In conclusion, the comparisons between the museums, the house museums and the civil rights museum illustrates that heritage is an arena for negotiating and reinforcing both progressive and conservative, conservative positions. But more importantly, it illustrates the emotional investments people make in particular values and narratives. It also illustrates how emotions work to propel some people to action and yet others to accept the status quo, even when they themselves may be disadvantaged by it. It highlights how heritage sites can be used to uphold ethnic privilege and feelings of social inclusion, while other sites are used to negotiate injustice and exclusion that feed into or intersect with struggles for recognition and redistribution. As I noted, these interviews were done in a different political context to that in which we find ourselves today. However, populism plays on the emotional and agonistic tension, social tensions that exist and are routinely rehearsed and reconstituted through the banal practices of visiting heritage sites and places. Heritage is not the only resource of power in political struggles, but, but it is an important site nonetheless of emotional justification. The significant insight offered by heritage to the re-emergent, sorry, the significant insight offered by heritage to the re-emergence of populism is to illustrate how the emotional repertories of heritage actively inform, support, or contest social and political debates. It illustrates how narratives that underpin or challenge populism or more, more run-of-the-mill conservatism are played out in mundane activities and points to the importance of understanding the effective qualities of how the past is brought to the present to do political work. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, ben, do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, yes, please, thank you. Thank you, Laura Jane Smith. A really warm thank you from all of us at the Heritage Centre and also a warm thank you from all our um, attendees from all around the world uh, for a really fascinating presentation and a thought-provoking insights into the multiple dynamics of, um, of Heritage performances, as you put it forward um, through these lively quotes uh, from, your, from your research. And also thank you for reminding us the role of emotion 
in heritage making. And as you know better than us, it's, it's a really ignored idea that emotion has been playing such an important role in, in heritage making, not just only in how people interact with the aesthetics of a building or the aesthetics of the material part of heritage, but actually how people respond in interpretations, how people select what actually they get um, uh, from the past, but more importantly, how emotion helps them to articulate what is the way, the modes that they identify themselves with the past, how they want to be recognized um, in the present, and what kind of claims they would like to be put forward mm. and how they can move from the, margin, the margins and the silences that they have put uh, through different political struggles. But first and foremost, um, how much emotion enables people to find themselves in resisting and come out through the power struggles that heritage can actually help them to actually think that there is more about their own past, there's something far more about their own future. So, and on that note, I would like to invite our attendees and uh, for questions, and I will pass to my uh, colleague, uh, Lila Yannick. Thank you, Laura Jane, once more. No worries, my pleasure. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Laura Jane, for such a stimulating talk and actually touching on the very contemporary while you were doing research sort of eight, eight years ago, but you still pick up what was going on in this underlining trend. Uh, as uh, pe people are invited to send the questions, but send the questions to the um, chat or do, because it's easier rather than for us choosing the person among almost uh, 200 people. Before we start, I can ask, can I ask the first question? Can we analyze heritage without thinking about the emotions or without taking emotions as a one of the aspects? Uh, no, <laughs> is the simple response. I think there's, there has been enough of a development of, of, of the studies of emotion now for, for um, in, in the social sciences and humanities to realise that, of course, emotion is integral, as I said in the, in the lecture, to our sense of to cognition, to the way we think. It frames the moral judgments we, we make, it frames, frames the evaluative, evaluative judgments we make. Um, you know, as we understand that, you know, objectivity is is you know that the, is influenced by our subject our, our, our subjective selves that we can't you know that we can't uh, divorce ourselves from our subjective selves. I guess is what I'm trying to say here. We can't divorce ourselves from our emotional self ourselves either. Emotion is integral to the way we think and the way we act. So no, I think emotion is is absolutely integral uh, to to how we engage with with heritage i mean if we i mean if we think about heritage it is it is in it is it conjures up it's just the, the the very word itself is as it's it's an emotive it conjures up a, a range of of emotions centered around identity well-being being sense of place sense of belonging and certainly um it, as part of the um the interviews that that i did uh, I was asking um, vis visitors, if I say the word heritage to you, what does that word mean to you? Um, and while a small proportion, less than 20%, offered definitions that fit snugly within the authorised discourse, you know, told me it was heritage, was building or buildings or archaeological sites or whatever, um, the, the, the vast majority actually um, talked about what heritage did for them, that sense of belonging, that sense of connectedness um, with whatever it was, na nation, family, or other, other groups. People often had trouble telling me exactly what the word meant because as many people said, it was more a feeling than it was something, um, that heritage was a feeling of belonging, a feeling of, of connectedness. So yeah. Heritage is, uh, sorry, emotion is absolutely integral. 
I have a first question which was sent to us, uh, hence I have chosen it despite that we have a restrictive time. And that's quite a long question. However, mm -hmm. I think it, it's quite interesting. Uh, why excellently shows, uh, uh, showed the way that people visit heritage sites to reinforce their pre-existing ideas and beliefs. But did you see example uh, of or space for heritage sites and interpretations to ever changing or shifting someone else's beliefs. Uh, is this possible in any large scale ways or is the interpretation really dominated by the pre existing assumptions. Yeah, so uh, yes, I did see people change their views and I did. Um, and, and that's, that's important, but I think I think, uh, yes, the majority of people who, well, people who go to, uh, to museums and heritage sites are going to, are going for emotional reasons. They're going to, to as I said, emotionally invest in what they already know, know and believe. But that doesn't mean that um, interventions into that can't be done. So yes, uh, about 20% of the people I, I um, interviewed when asked the question, did, did anything um, you see here change your views, et cetera, uh, said, yes, it, it had. Most of that was in relatively small ways that, you know, in, in effect that people just got new information or, or, or whatever. But there were people who did have epiphanies, who did sit back and think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm t totally changed my, my, my thinking. And this, and this occurred most frequently at, um, museums where the curatorial staff had been quite active, self-consciously active, knowingly engaged with exhibition techniques that aimed to address people's emotions, that gave people the, the opportunities and, and um, to actually self-consciously engage with their emotions that weren't afraid of, of engendering an emotional response and, and to, um, to work with that. And, and specifically uh, to engender deep empathy that was linked to, you know, provided them the space to, to be imaginative and compassionate. Um, and the two museums that, that I had showed the greatest uh, frequency of people changing their views was the National Civil Rights Museum that I talked about today and the Immigration Museum in, in, in Melbourne. Um, both, as I said, both sites that were, were curatorial staff were, were, if you like, emotionally intelligent about um, their interpretation techniques. So I think, you know, again, coming back to your, your original question, I think here uh, about the importance of emotion that one of the things that comes out of, of, of that research is, is that we need to not shy away from the emotional and that we need to develop interpretive techniques, exhibition techniques that, um, that are emotionally intelligent, that, that, you know, that by which I mean that we are aware of the emotion and that we are utilising or, 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 or attempting to engage with visitor emotions in constructive ways to give them the space and the resources that they need to deal with their cognitive dissonance in constructive ways. That's that's leads very very well actually the answer to 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 the, ne the next questions and and the question is thank you uh, for the insightful talk. I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on the role of the museum slash sites itself. Do you think museum have a responsibility to impart histories? of oppression in a way that dissolve visitors to remain comfortable in the face of it. Sorry, do I think that that museums have a responsibility to maintain well, people? If, if the, you know, what's the role of the museum? I think the, 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 the oh. question is in terms of making people comfortable or uncomfortable about what's going on or what they are presenting. We've, there's been an argument in muse museological or museum studies that you know museums are safe place places for uh, unsafe ideas and i think that's been a very misleading and problematic um, assumption yes museums are safe places but they're safe in 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 the wrong sense they're safe for um 
they're safe places for people from, from privileged backgrounds to go and feel comfortable in. And they're often unsafe places for people who, whose own sense of historical and contemporary experiences are, are excluded from the museum. Hence, you know, if we look at the, the, the profile of, of most of visitors to most national museums and so on, it's, it's, it's white and upper, you know, white and middle class, well-educated visitors and, and, and a range of, range of groups are excluded. Um, or don't feel compelled to visit. Um, you know, we are speaking to a particular, we are thus speaking to a particular audience and, and, and that sense of safety is continually being reinforced and, and works despite what museums may, may think that they are doing to maintain the, the social status, status quo. So yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what we want museums to be about. Do we want them to be about managing the, the and, and the emotional commitment to, to uh, national narratives, or do we want museums to, um, to engage in social debate? If we want museums to engage in social debate, we need to, to take people out of their comfort zones. We won't always achieve that, of course, but, um, but taking people out of their comfort zones requires us to think more about Emotion, the emotions that people invest in in in, in their visits, um, because as as I said, the facts alone are not going to persuade um, persuade your audiences. Another thank you. Another question is linked with actually your invitation to ask about your methodologies used. So the question is, I am interested in the methodology of your research in emotion and the heritage sites, as emotion is such a multifaceted and complex things to analyze. Do you develop a framework uh, for categorizing interview responses to create a quantitative da da data from responses or was your evaluation purely qualitative? Thank you again. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so I, I did an insane amount. <laughs> An insane amount of interviews. I don't ever want to interview a visitor again at, 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 at a museum. I think I've done, been there, done that. But four and a half thousand interviews are a, is a significant body of of qualitative data because, as you saw, the list of questions there were twelve questions, um, all of which had um, open ended responses. So all the interviews were were, were um, transcribed and then coded. And we coded them for the themes that were coming out of, of the um, uh, out of what people were saying to to us, but we also coded them in terms of their uh, um, emotional registers. So um, I developed this the, the, the concept of, of registers of emotion to look at the intensities of of the emotions that people were expressing in in their in their interviews. Um, and this coding, of course, resulted in in, in uh, was fed into uh, the um, statistical package, packages, and 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 um, descriptive stats were generated, which I cross tabulated against um, variables such as 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 educational attainment, gender, and and um, ethnic identifications, and so so on and so forth. Um, but yes, it became it became very clear early on in the coding um, that we needed a, an instrument that would allow for um, a finer understanding of, of emotions. It wasn't just enough to say this visitor was angry or this visitor was expressing empathy or, or, or whatever. We needed to, to something that would allow us to, to unpick um, the intensities of, of emotions and, and, you know, whether it was something that was banal or commonplace or, or every day, whether it was a quiet or an intense emotion, um, you know, whether the empathy, for instance, so on the register of engagement on, on the, the notion of empathy, we had shallow empathy, um, moving through to deep, um, imaginative, um, compassionate empathy. Because of course, you know, as 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 the data reveals, um, the quiet and shallow emotions can do as much as the deep and hot emotions in 
the heritage performances that a visitor was 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 undertaking, whether that was reinforcement, intergenerational communication, recognition or mis misrecognition. Thank you. So it, it, another question coming from uh, from different um, point of view, and and the question is. Uh, my question is about the change of emotion in post-destruction post cases of cultural heritage site. How could we address destruction in relation to cultural heritage? Well, oh, that's, that, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I mean, certainly, I think one of the interesting questions to ask about um, the destruction of heritage, whether it's 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 forced destruction or the the decay of time or, or the changing of values that lead to the de the decision that something that was once heritage is no longer heritage. I think one of the interesting research questions there is to look at the shifting emotional responses people have have to 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 the heritage and or its absence. Um, so I mean, I think there is there is a lot to to unpick in that question about um, heritage, heritage, the relationship of, of emotion to heritage, and I think that's that's would make an interesting research topic or PhD topic, um, looking at what what is the emotional impact in in particular of of um, the, dis, the the loss of heritage, the the um, the destruction of heritage. As well as the, the you know, the uh, understanding how emotions change in relation to the past, so that things that were once heritage are no longer deemed to to be of importance. So there are yeah, there's a range of very interesting interesting thoughts there. There are a few questions uh, about the time, and one of them is how important is or what role time plays alongside new context narratives in shifting recognition or indifference? Okay, so that's an, yeah, that's an interesting question. What role does time play? Um, you know, it, it varied considerably um, in, in people's responses, that the, 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 the temporal depth. For some, uh, for some time was of course really important for others temporal depth not so much um, it didn't matter whether something happened you know a hundred years 500 years or yesterday it was it could be as significant to some people um, certainly time was used in 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 some visitors responses particularly in cognitive dissonant in in quite Quite strange and 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 and, and conflicting ways. So, um, for instance, there is, you know, a certain sense that the age of uh, you know the, the age depth of some of some uh, heritage sites and so on was really important, but that could be turned on its head um, when. Um, the visitor was engaged in con cognitive dissonance. Oh, that happened so long ago, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. That was three, four hundred, five hundred years ago. We don't need to deal with that any, any, anymore. But in the same, same breath, a visitor could go, oh, you know, this is 500 years old. This is really important. So time, time was used in, in, a, in a range of, 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 of different ways. I mean, I know for archaeologists, you know, that. <laughs> the depth of time is often very important to us, but it's not necessarily as important to visitors. It can be, but not necessarily. Time was very malleable. The sense of time was very malleable in the way people engaged with science. Right. The, the other question is much more specific and relates to Holocaust. In sites like Holocaust or immigration museums, were the visitors ever naive? Would they not visit predisposed and looking at the emotional effect? Was there a sense of honest or dishonest emotional effect? Um, okay, so I mean, I think I think one of the important things to 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 recognise is that 
that visitors go to sites that speak to them, um, that they have some prior knowledge about that they care about. Uh, so I didn't encounter many visitors that you would identify as, as, as uninformed um, about what they, they were visiting, if I've understood your question correctly. I did on occasion find visitors who were visiting because they entirely disagreed with what, what they understood the museums stood for. So at one immigration museum, um, uh, I encountered a gentleman who, who, um, who had come to visit to reaffirm his disregard for immigration. So he was actively in, 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 engaged in a, in, a, in a performance that that affirmed his sense that that immigration, and this was in, the, uh, in, in Australia, that immigration was bad. Um, and at, at another site uh, uh, on, on the history of, um, this was in America, on another, on another site on, on the histories of uh, Americans at war, um, I'm engaged with a, a, another visitor um, who was visiting, he was he self-identified as, as Asian American and was visiting to assess um, the extent to which he thought the, the that, that museum was misrepresenting um, American history, the sense to which he he suspected that he, as, a, as an Asian American, was excluded from the from the um, that the story being told. Now, the fact that I <laughs> can actually identify two people out of four and a half thousand that would were actively doing that um, shows you the extent to which, at least in the sample I had, people come to museums that they already have an affinity for, um, and and and, emo and engage both emotionally and, and intellectually. Um, in that context. Here is a very interesting point because uh, someone says, I would like to challenge uh, Laura Jane's statement regarding the idea that emotions are shared by current ideology and uh, feeling rules. I am thinking, for example, of the current Central and Eastern European countries during the communist Stalinist, Stalinist era where aristocratic of bourgeois origin was stigmatized and former property owners were thrown out of their houses and had to watch their property, their family or national heritage being devastated by then promoting working peasant classes. The, the ideology of uh, feeling rules of the time were completely at odds with what the rightful owners of those historical properties felt. They cause dissonance and opposition and only negative emotions. The former owners could not be forced to adopt the current narrative at the worker and the worker peasant points of view. Yep. Um, okay, so <laughs> feeling rules um, vary considerably. They, they are themselves framed by um, social and cultural contexts. Uh, they change over time, they change, um, you know, they, they are influenced by social structures such as class, um, gender, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, I'm not quite sure I understood the question, but, you know, certainly it's important to stress that the feeling rules, the effective practices um, that we engage in are not, they're not absolute. They're not fixed in stone. They vary from social context, political context, um, and, uh, uh, and, they, and, and they vary across time. Um, <clears throat> they also, I mean, certainly, you know, the feeling rules, as I said, in the, the Australian War Memorial are very different from the feeling rules that um, occurred at the, the National Civil Rights Museum or occurred at or, or, or expressed by by visitors at say Uluru, another site that 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 I, that I looked at. Different places, different contexts have different have different feeling rules, um, and it also doesn't mean that those rules can't be actively changed, uh, contested, um, and um, 
you know, and, and fought against. It's... I and I do... Yeah, sorry. I, I understand where questions come from. And I also understand your um, not being familiar what happened in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. My answer would be that if you go to the certain point of Krakow, which is the most or was the most bourgeois uh, city with the very, very strong sense of heritage, when the workers came and the big steel mine has been built, it happened that the workers be, be start to behave like bourgeois rather mm -hmm. than the bourgeois behave like the workers, despite that the narrative of the country was in the HAD was in a certain way, but you have those undercurrents which you are very often showing, which shows that it is not straightforward. There's lots of grace. Yeah, of course, of course, and 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 you know we shouldn't underestimate the assimilative power of heritage either. The 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 desire for for um, societies to use concepts of heritage to assimilate people into uh, into the values and, and emotional states that that maintain the social status quo as well um, as well as the the, the the power of heritage to challenge to challenge that but you know it heritage has a significant power um, facilitated you know it's 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 part of the authorized discourse you know to to to, to assimilate um, and, and of course, you know, we have to be, we have to be careful as well in struggles over recognition and so on that we don't engage in assimilation, the engagement of assimilation of, of excluded groups into, um, into the comforting narratives of, uh, or the consensus narratives of, of, of nation is not, is not recognition. That's just simply assimilation. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is of course very great. It's a very complex, um, these are very complex issues, but I think you know, I think they're you know obviously I think they're very interesting issues issues that we should be look you know we should be engaged in researching more within heritage. There are a few questions concerning management. Can I ask one of them? Given that many heritage sites beyond museum exist and operate within the tourism economy, which itself is firmly aligned with the nation of the experience economy and transformative visitors experience, could you comment on the challenge for site management organizations who may have to finally balance the surface approach of providing a fun day out with challenging each visitor to engage deeply. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the fun day out, then having a nice day out. A lot of visitors talked about how they were having a nice day out. All the all the museums and and, and heritage sites that, that I looked at can also be understood as tourism sites. You know, the the British Museum is a site of tourism, for instance. Um, as much as it is uh, can be understood in other in, in other contexts. So having a nice day out was what most what what a significant proportion of visitors talked about in terms of what they they were doing they were being touristic um you know we tend to we tend to want to place tourists in a different bucket to other other visitors to museums but you know visitors tourists whatever it whatever whatever word you want to bring to it what people are doing when they are visiting sites however we call that call that or what they are doing, tourism, visiting, whatever. What they are doing is they're engaging in these performances of, of reinforcement, recognition, misrecognition, intergenerational um, communication, and so on. And, and indeed, at, there could be indeed other performances that are occurring at, at other types of sites than those that I looked at. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, I would say the same, the same, the same issues arise um, is that if, if we want to engage visitors to get them thinking to, to get them thinking about their entrance narratives to get them reflecting on it then we need again to engage with visitor emotions and not be afraid of that not be afraid I mean certainly the a lot of the the literature in in in, in heritage has dismissed tourism as 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 you know 
facilitating more pish nostalgia or just you know it, you know that it's bad history or or, or or whatever we haven't quite shaken off those critiques and I think we need to we need to recognize that what's what's being done is a form of heritage whether they're tourists visitors whatever you want to call them and in and engage critically with the emotional um, repertoires of of the particular effective practices of visiting and not be afraid to intervene into the feeling rules that may exist at particular particular sites. And I'm not saying that if we do this, that we will get 100% of people going, oh, I've had an epiphany going to this site and I'm now thinking deeply and critically, but we might get more than um, the, you know, 20% that, that, that I found in my sample. We got, might get more people um, engaging more critically and we might open the the demographic of 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 museum heritage site visitors uh, if we if we can you know engage emotionally intelligently with the diversity of 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 notions of heritage and historical and contemporary experiences I, I hope that makes sense <laughs> yeah, I, I can hear the, the Australian magpies. I thought first that there's something wrong with my computer, but you right. promised the Australian magpies. That's, that's so, right, you, you are hearing them. The sun is, the sun is coming up. Um, and yes, you can hear them singing now in the background. I'm afraid our time is come, has come and we, we need to finish. On behalf of the organizers and myself, I would like to say a tremendous thank you for actually getting up so early and sharing with us your ideas and inspiring us to read your book to those who hasn't read. And I am sure that our participants, uh, you know, the listeners to your talk were engaged very much in thinking about heritage, not just as it is, but also not only as a process, but also as a performance. I would like to say thank you very much, Solora Jane, and invite everybody on Thursday next week for our uh, heritage seminar, which take place online one o'clock on Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for your comments. I'm, I, I understand that they're going to, to uh, copy the chat for me. So thank you very much. <laughs>